UC Master Gardener Program of Santa Clara County would like to welcome you to selecting and planting California native plants. My name is Sharon Erickson. I'm a Master Gardener volunteer here in Santa Clara County and will be your moderator for tonight's session. First, a few words about Zoom settings. We're recording this session, so please keep your microphone muted and your, mic and your video off. Um, closed captioning is available. It's enabled for those of you who would like to use it. Um, tonight's session is being recorded and is scheduled to go from 7 to 8.30. Please use the chat function if you'd like to send us any questions during, at any time during the session, but we'll probably hold most of those questions until the end after the presentation, and then we'll get to them then. And with that, I'd like to introduce your presenter for this session, Carol Peck. Carol is a UC, active UC Master Gardener. She's been a volunteer since 2017. Carol, you wanna start? Sure. Welcome to the talk this evening. Um, this is Selecting and Planting California Natives, of course. And it's focused on Palo Alto since the Palo Alto Library requested this. But the information I'm going to be giving, you can go to any of the links and select the site that you want. And here's a little bit of an overview um, to talk about UCCE and Master Gardeners. Um, we are trained by the University of California. We have a help desk, and there's a link on, on your handout to how to get the help desk, uh, the website. We have one for the state and one for local events, and that local events is also on your handout. Uh, monthly email and gardening tips and news that you can sign up for, and you only get one a month. We don't do spam. And we have demonstration and research gardens throughout the county. And we have events like we used to have garden markets, but and we hope to in the future. And we have in-person training starting again after COVID-19, of course, and classes and talks online like you're having tonight. Okay. Here we go. Um, the topics we're gonna to be going over tonight is when to plant, what to plant, and how to plant. And like Sharon was saying, uh, we're asking you to please enter your questions in the chat area and we can filter those and get to those as we go along. Um, when to plant them. Ideally, this is the perfect time because you plant potted plants right before the rain starts to allow good root growth. Um, seeds, on the other hand, usually start after the first rain so they can sprout in moist soil and establish roots and of course have flowers for next year, especially the annuals. And one of the things, if you like me, make sure you label the area that you put the seeds, otherwise you may dig it up and try and plant something else on top of it, which is not a good idea. <laughs> um, also propagation techniques, um, this is again is in your handout, um, how to start various types of seeds, both um, fruits, vegetables, and California natives. Uh, when to plant. Um, the first thing you need to focus on in planting and planting is the trees and make sure you allow enough space for the full size tree. Um, it may look small now, but you need to have the space so it can grow. Otherwise, it'll get stunted and won't have enough room. Um, shrubs, obviously you put those in between the trees or along the borders, and you need to ensure that you keep pathways. Ideally, you put down some stepping stones or something like that, so you can access the plants for trimming and weeding and all that good stuff. Herbaceous plants, i.e. plants without woody stems, those are the smaller ones. Um, you keep it away from the roots of the tree and the shrubs so that everything can grow at its own pace and be happy. Um, what to plant? 
best site that I found is the Calscape, where you can go in and then you zip code and it'll come up with a bunch of categories. And you create the category and you scan through it and you can select the plant that would be ideal for your yard so far as pieces uh, and all kinds of information there. Um, when I pulled it up last, it listed 86 plants that are native to Palo Alto and are available in local, in, I shouldn't say local nurseries, available in nurseries. Um, and they do list the nurseries for you for each plant. And they sit, have the amount of sun that's required, whether it's full sun, part sun, shade, whatever, how much water it needs, the type of soil, the temp, maximum or minimum temperature, I should say. And then other requirements are listed for every, every plant. And one of the nice things is for each plant, once you find it, it'll give you a list of nurseries where you can possibly find that plant. So you don't have to go hunting all over and trying to find the plant you want. Now let's go on to the actual plants. Out of those 86 plants, I whittled it down to things that are more drought tolerant and easier to grow. Because some of them grow in more of a swampy thing along the edge of the bay and easy to grow is always, always a plus. Here's a California buckeye. Susan was just mentioning she has one of these beautiful plants in her yard, trees. Um, you can see the flowers at the bottom. Um, they come in the spring. These wonderful leaves are gorgeous, but at the end of summer and actually fall, they start losing their leaves with the heat and everything else. Uh, it's recommended that these be watered at least twice, twice a month. And by watering, what we mean is a deep soak, slow and long to get it really deep in there. Um, it can get uh, 40 feet tall by 40 feet wide. However, um, that's with ideal circumstances and it depends on what you have so far as in, in your yard. If, if you have a um, hill or something you wanna keep in place, this also has a good deep root system. So it can help stabilize the soil for you. Uh, the holly leaf cherry um, also has a relative the Santa Catalina cherry. This great, just found in the Santa Catalina Islands, in South, Santa, South California. And this one is a slow growing one. It flowers beautifully in the spring and it is an evergreen. So it has, doesn't drop its leaves. And the water is, a, it says maximum once a month, but I actually, with this drought, have been watering mine twice a month and it's coming out just fine. Like I said, it is a slow grower. You have to be patient with these. It can get up to 40 feet tall and 20 feet wide. Carol, this is Sharon. A couple of people are having trouble hearing you. So if you could speak kind of clearly and distinctly into the microphone, that might help. Your sound is coming through fine for me, but some other people are having a problem. Thanks. Okay, we'll do. Okay, and of course the coast live oak is one of the most common trees in our area. And it's very low water and it does flower in the spring or winter. Um, the problem is that the flowers are so tiny, it's really hard to see and they're kind of like a yellowish color. So they really don't stand out. Of course it is an evergreen, so it does provide shade and it can get up to 80 feet tall and 35 feet wide if given the room and it needs although it can be pruned to keep it smaller if you want. Um, the California laurel is also known as the bay laurel uh, because these leaves have been used in cooking and things like that, but it's not anything like the standard bay leaf that you get at the store. It has a very distinct, different flavor. 
Um, it does flower in the spring. It's really pretty. It is also evergreen, so you don't have a dry spot in your yard. And it'll take water up to three times a month. This is also uh, grown along rivers and streams and things like that. So it likes a nice deep watering. It can get up to 80 feet tall and, and 30 feet wide. Um, I had fun one day up in Napa, we took a balloon ride. I spotted a bay laurel tree and the balloon pilot let us down so I could pick some leaves off the top of the tree for my cooking that night, which was kind of fun. Okay, now we're gonna go into the shrubs. And again, I've picked things that are relatively drought tolerant and more of evergreen so you don't have brown spots in your yard. Um, this is a coyote bush. Um, it has lots of flowers all over the bush, as you can see in the spring. It is never green, although these flowers um, do turn brown and you can cut them off and they will produce more, more flowers as they go along. Um, this one, the maximum water is once a week and that'll keep it green and then some. Um, I've actually gotten away with a watering it only once every two weeks in Gilroy and it's doing just fine. It can grow up to 10 feet tall and 20 feet wide. What I do is I trim it back every winter to keep it about three feet tall and about four feet wide. So it looks like a nice shrub and it takes pruning very easily. This is a coffee berry. Again, it's an evergreen. It flowers in the spring. The flowers are kind of blend in with the foliage down here. And so they're kind of hard to see. Um, and it does produce berries. However, it's not recommended to use it for coffee. Uh, they do have a slight uh, amount of poisonous qualities to them, which can upset your stomach. So it's not recommended for eating. Um, watering is only about twice a month during the summer, and it can get 15 feet to, whoops, excuse me, 15 feet by 15 feet. Um, this is another one that is good for, you can trim it, and you can do it in a shrub, or you can build a hedge out of these if you want a hedge or a border or something like that. Uh, this is a toy on also known as a holly berry. It does bloom in, in the spring and the flowers are kind of small and white. And it has these beautiful red berries in the winter, which are great for decorating all kinds of things. Um, and the birds do like them. Uh, again, this is not recommended for human consumption because unripe berries do have a uh, toxin. Ripe berries are considered edible, but don't taste too good. Um, again, this is a water twice a month. It can get uh, 30 feet tall by 15 feet wide. And again, this is one that you can <clears throat> prune to just by any size you want. And you can build a hedge out of this as well. Okay, the silver lupin is absolutely gorgeous in the spring, late spring and summer when it flowers. And it is an evergreen, so you don't have a stump there. Um, it only needs water about twice a month to keep it green throughout the summer. And this is bigger than I've ever seen it. 30 feet, they say it can grow 30 feet tall and 15 feet wide. But most of the ones I've seen in yards, because they keep the flowers Prune back are only about three feet tall and four feet wide. Okay, this is a, a blood current, and this actually does have berries that are edible. Um, my challenge in my yard has been trying to get to the berries before the birds do. The birds absolutely love this. Um, it does flower in the winter to late spring, and they call it 
blood current, this is the color of the flowers. You can see the berries in the lower right hand corner, and those are kind of a purplish color. They're not really sweet, but they're savory. Um, it does like a good deep watering because the roots go down. Um, it can get 13 feet tall by seven feet wide, this variety. Um, however, I keep my prune down to a manageable shrub. Uh, one thing about the Ribes genus is they have two varieties. They have ones that are called currant, and those are nice, tame plants. We have ones that are called gooseberry, and those have thorns all over the plant and are extremely prickly. So if you're gonna look for any of these, it's one that's called a current, not one that's called a gooseberry. And the California wild rose has only a single layer of petals, unlike the commercial roses we have now. And it loses its leaves in the late fall and goes deciduous, but it comes back in the late winter and early spring. And recommended watering three times a month. It can get tall, but again, this is one that can be pruned to just about any size. These are the rose hips in the lower right hand corner. One interesting story about the California wild rose or the roses throughout the US is there were no roses um, originally of this variety in Europe. They brought them back to Europe and did a lot of crossbreeding to get the beautiful flowers that we have now, the crossbred roses. So this is one of the plants that went into that genotype and crossbreeding. And for those of you who have been out into the Santa Cruz Mountains, I'm sure you've seen Pacific blackberry out there, along with all its thorns. <laughs> the flowers are in winter and spring and rather small, and the berries mature late spring. Um, this, they say to water it once a month, but the thing is, these grow right along creek beds. So if you have a dry yard, you may have to water it up to three or four times a month in order to keep it looking good and healthy. Again, they said this is listed as up to six feet tall and six feet wide. However, we know how these things can spread. And you can actually train these on a trellis if you're ambitious and want to have berries they're easily picked. Okay, I call these short California natives. These are the herbaceous ones that have the non woody stems. The Oregon gumweed has flowers for a long time. It has a majority in spring, but it does continue to flower into fall. You just have to pick off the dead flowers and it will continue flowering. Um, it says it's summer semi-dormant if you don't water it enough. If you do the watering, it'll stay beautiful and green all year round. Uh, again, this five foot tall by seven feet wide is an overestimation. I've grown this in my yard for years and I keep it the flowers trimmed back and it's only about six inches tall unless it's flowering and it gets about a foot tall. And deadheading just means removing the dead flowers. And for those of you who like to have a nice tall grassy look, there is a Junkus patens a common rush. And this is not like the ones that grow in the water. This actually prefers it, a drier soil texture. And it is an evergreen, doesn't die back. Again, I've got these in my yard. It had, the flowers are white and kind of a pinkish red. It flowers in the spring, you can see the upper left, the 
white flowers there and it, it turns into kind of a brown puffy area that stays there. Um, this is actually the size that it gets about three feet by three feet. And it, once it gets that size, if you want to have more plants, you can dig it up and separate it into three or four plants and, and spread it out. So it can be managed that way too. This is one of the ones that grows from a bulb. <clears throat> it's a ethereal sphere. Um, it does come up vibrant in the spring and it's two feet tall with the blooms. The foliage down below is only about six or eight inches tall. Um, and it is, it says summer deciduous, which means it dies back in the late summer or to fall. And you won't see it necessarily until the following spring when it comes back. Um, if you water it, the, the leaves may stay, but turn, start turning brown later on. Um, it gets two feet tall and then it can spread to five feet wide. Like I said, with the other one, you can dig this up and separate it in so you can have little clumps throughout the yard too. The vervain is kind of an interesting flower. This one blooms from the bottom up and you can see it has kind of a lavender or blue hue to it, depending on the variety you can find. And it blooms for a long time because of this blooming up a stem. It says it's summer deciduous, which means it dies back in, in late summer or fall. And it likes water once a week, a good deep watering, but it doesn't like to be overwatered. That's why they said once a week. And again, this is the 2.6 feet is with the blooms, the foliage, as you can see at the base. It's not very big. This is kind of a neat contrast to the types of plants that you have in your yard. Now, how to plant these? The pot of plants, um, this is a step-by-step. -step. Um, the hole needs to be as deep as the root fall, fall and twice as wide. Um, you need to give the plant roots room to grow sideways. And you don't dig as deep because you need the support to keep it from sinking further into the soil. Remove it from the pot, you remove some soil from the root ball and put that, break that up and put it into the hole and mix it in with the rest of the soil and untangle any roots, any wrapped roots need to be straightened out and spread out. And then of course you put plant in the hole and, and backfill with the soil and water it to the depth of the roots so it's moist. Um, you have to be careful with California natives not to overwater them. Okay, watering new plants um, need regular water. So in this drought, um, if you're gonna start new plants, you need to plan to have some uh, uh, watering can nearby so you can fill it up once in a while and take it out there and water them. Um, a general guide is that the first year is weekly for um, the herbaceous plants. Um, and then you can do maybe once, a, start it once a week and then once every two weeks and then uh, gradually uh, decrease the water. The second year is every two weeks for low water plants. The third year is three weeks for drought tolerant plants. The fourth year is monthly for very low water plants. Again, this is very specific. You have to look at the plant and what the plant requires. This is just a general guideline when you're starting out. And no summer water after the first year for large trees, especially oaks. They don't like a lot of water in their soil. And the watering depth, um, we recommend you check it every two weeks after the rain stops. 
you wait till it's dry from two to six inches. Uh, the variance is, variance is that um, two inches for the shallow rooted um, herbaceous plants, six inches for the shrubs or, or trees before you even start to water. And then you water the soil, not the plant leaves. Um, <clears throat> they're not used to any rain during the summer. So you, you can actually uh, damage the leaves if you water the leaves, like a, a sprinkler or something like that. <clears throat> and you water around the plant on the drip line. For those who don't know what a drip line is, if you look at a plant, you'll see there's a, the furthest leaves from the center of the plant is what we call the drip line. Because if it rained, that would be where the water would drip out at the furthest. So that's where you would water. And the water would be low and slow to penetrate our clay soil. And most of us, I think, have clay soil in this area. Um, again, water to six inches depth for herbaceous and 12 inches deep for trees and shrubs because their root system is deeper. Mulch, yes, print these love mulch. Biodegradable material around the new plants is a great way to help them. And it depends on the type of plant, um, small wood chips, for woodland or coastal shrubs is great. A woodland, we need like an oak woodland or something like that. Gravelish sand for succulents, chaparral or desert, of course. Um, and if leaf litter compiles on top of the mulch, the orient, leave it, leave it in place. It will biodegrade and help feed your plants some more. And pine needles, we recommend for uh, acid loving plants. And then no plastic, please no plastic landscape fabric. Um, it blocks the, the soil getting into the, or excuse me, the water getting into the soil. And it's unhealthy for the critters like earthworms who can't get up through it. So make sure you get something that should be biodegradable. And large pieces of wood can attract lizards, which is a good thing. You can control a lot of bugs that way, or even mice, which is not necessarily so good. Okay, when to mulch and where to mulch. Okay, spring, replenish anything that's been washed away with the rain. Summer is what we may need to make sure that everything is nice and thickly covered. And you spread it around the, around the drip line again. Don't shove it underneath the plant because <clears throat> the trunk of the, or the core of the plant needs to breathe and so you need to keep it back away from the trunk <clears throat> or the center of the plant. And if the mulch really does wonderful things. It keeps the soil evenly moist and retains it. It also keeps the temperature even. So in the really hot days, it keeps the soil cooler. And <clears throat> if you're wondering if you need it during the winter, it can actually keep the soil warmer in the winter for us. It also helps keep down the weeds, which is one of my favorite reasons for it. And it decomposes to fertilize the plants. Uh, weeds. Um, laying down newspaper or cardboard so that it overlaps, so that when you put the mulch on top, the weeds can't find their way through. Um, then it's easiest to weed during the rainy season because you can pull them out easier. And <clears throat> you can cut them to the ground, but you have to do it many times during the year before it actually decides roots don't have enough nutrient, uh, doesn't have enough energy from leaves and it finally dies. Um, we ask that you don't use herbicides because herbicides were initially developed to kill native plants because you're we trying to grow our the non-native crops we have, you know, our tomatoes and everything else. So that we need to make sure that 
we don't use any herbicides on the California news. <clears throat> and then just a note, weeds without flowers and seed can go into a compost bin. However, if it blooms and produces seed, put it into your city uh, recycling bin and don't put it into your recycling bin. They have a uh, control and it gets hot enough so they can kill those seeds. <coughs> Excuse me. Fertilizer. Really, California natives don't need fertilizer. Um, a lot, I've known people that have fertilized the, their California natives and unfortunately they died and they wonder why they were died because they were, thought it, they were treating them wonderfully. Well, they probably were if it was a standard plant, but you can kill them with kindness, unfortunately. If you want to put a little bit of extra nutrients in the soil, compost really helps. And it also helps with keeping moisture in. Um, potted plants, however, do need a little bit of fertilizer to replace the nutrients that are washed away. In this case, use, using the compost is good or one quarter the strength of a slow release fertilizer or just a little bit of liquid kelp will help them survive until you can get them into the ground. Um, pruning, like I said earlier, deadheading is to move the dead flowers and encouraging more flowers. Um, you may hear the term coppice. This is to cut a plant down to the ground two to six inches. And this is done for a plant looking really bad and it'll help the plant regrow, but it depends on the plant. You can't do this for trees. Some shrubs that are really um, easy to grow like the buckwheat or something like that, stand up to this. Uh, the junk of grass, if it starts looking really bad, you can do this and it'll come back beautifully in the next year. Um, pruning is basically the same pruning technique that you would use on anything else. If the branches are touching, you need to remove one of them so it doesn't touch. Um, any branches that are growing straight up and you want a lot of flowers or a lot of fruit, um, it's the horizontal, the more Horizontal branches or 45 degree branches that produce the, the fruit and flowers. And then cleaning out the inner area to keep circulation and preventing rot. It's always a good idea. And don't shear or over prune, um, especially Cenothus or the California lilac. That one, if you trim more than one or two branches a year, it will actually die on you. So be very careful with that one. Okay, yard cleanup. Um, you've heard of that blow and go guy. Uh, we recommend that you sweep the matter into the beds to have more, thick, more material that's gonna break down and feed your plants. Um, blowing actually will move the debris and the mulch from the yard and it will compact the soil. <clears throat> and again, putting the weeds with flowers and seeds in the yard waste bin. And then this list of resources is the same as this list of resources in your handout. California Natives, again, this is a wonderful source for browsing and seeing what you like and picking out plants that you want to put into your yard and how much water and everything else it needs. The California Native Plant Society also has uh, talks, just like Master Gardeners have talks about how to grow and where to grow and all that. Um, there's also a Gardening with Natives forum on the California Native Plant Society. <clears throat> if you're thinking about starting to see this link to the propagation techniques um, has things for California natives as well as fruits and vegetables and all kinds of things, ornamentals, 
to me, but it, it has just got everything in there. And then the Master Gardener Help Desk is open to everyone. This is the link that has the information about um, submitting a question or request via email, or you can call into our hotline. And then the UC Davis has an excellent integrated pest management where you can look up the plant that you have and find out what bugs you might be attacking it. And that's all I had for right now. So if we can get the questions from the chat, I would appreciate it. Sharon, are you there? Sorry, there I am. I couldn't get my cursor to move. I've got two screens going and couldn't get my cursor to move. So if you want to um, put back up those links, just in case, I posted those in the, um, in the chat. They're on the handout, so I posted that there. Um, why don't we start with the questions kind of in the order that came in? So back to trees. RB asks, do you have any concerns about planting bay trees near oak trees? Yes. Um, the bay tree is the um, host for the uh, root disease that will kill oaks. So the, you don't want to have a bay tree next to an oak tree. You want to have those as far apart as possible to keep the <clears throat> sudden oak death from the oak trees. Yeah, sudden oak death is a real concern. One of my brothers lives up in the Santa Cruz Mountains and he jokes, all they may have left after this is done is bay trees. Um, but we're hoping to preserve our oaks. Let's see. Um, oh, RB also asked, so then we had some watering questions. So RB posted a link to a CMPS guide on planting method for California natives that recommends the, I don't know what to call it, except root washing, um, where, where the root, you wash off the roots and then a minimal disturbance of the soil around that in order to encourage the plant to move its roots directly into the native soil. He, he's wondering if one way is better than the other way. Um, that hasn't been um, scientifically tested. Both ways work. Um, the key thing here is how much water does your plant that you're gonna put in tolerate? If you're putting in an oak, you may not wanna consider that because the roots can get too wet and not be happy. If you're planting um, something like an herbaceous plant or something like that, you can rot, actually rinse all the, um, potting mix away and, and put it directly into the soil. In fact, you want to have, a, in that case, you want to have a little bit of muddy mix so you can pack it in pretty well. But either way, it does work. And then Bill asks, what about watering in dry, in a dry winter? So for example, if a month usually gets four inches of rain, um, do, do we want to water to mimic the winter rains? Unfortunately, the answer is yes, <clears throat> we do, because since it's expecting that rain and we're in such a severe drought, in order to keep our plants healthy and, and keep going, we need to provide that water. In fact, we've noticed on some of our walks in the uh, parks and things like that, that a lot of the native plants that are out in the wild are looking very peaked and, and raggedy because they haven't gotten enough water. So in order to keep your plants healthy in your yard, yes, you would need the water even in the winter if you've gotten a month without water. Yeah, and then RB um, pointed to a um, website, Tree of Life Nursery, where they have recommendations on watering native plants. Um, just glancing at that link, RB, I'm not seeing 
much that's that different from what you'll see in every every kind of loc every place you look about watering native plants, which is you you water them in the first few months of life, certainly first few months after you've planted them in the first year, second year. Carol, did you want to say any more about that on just kind of watering during the lifespan of a tree or, or any plants? Um, watering, I recommend using the, the calscape <clears throat> because that is actually um, done by UC Davis and the California Native Plant Society. And they've done a lot of research on that. Um, these other places usually <laughs> use a lot of the information from Calscape to propagate theirs, or they may use personal information for their area. And you have to make sure that you're in the same area that they are to make sure you're getting the right water. And then Bill asked, um, you know, if you're trying to water down to a depth of six to 12 inches, um, is that for new plants or established plants? And then how do you know how much water to put down to get to that depth? Good question. <laughs> um, what I do is I take a digging tool and I make a little hole and I water around it. I don't water in the hole. I water around the plant and I check every once in a while to see if it's penetrating and see how much water is already in there. Because the top um, six inches may be dry, but if you go down 12 inches, you may have water down there. So you only have to water six inches. So checking, you actually digging down and checking your soil is the best way to determine that. Yeah, and if I could just add, everybody has different types of soil. So many of us are heavy clay. Some people are in a more sandy soil. You really have to, it depends on what your soil type is. Um, Definitely. Bill also asks about rule of thumb on first year, second year plants and watering schemes. Um, does that apply to Palo Alto or does it also apply to hotter areas like Morgan Hill or Liven Livermore? Yes, it applies everywhere. Um, I live in Gilroy and I use it all the time and I've had great success with that. Um, <clears throat> Palo Alto, you actually may be able to uh, use a little, little less because they do have a more humid environment since they're closer to the bay. Of course, when you're, if you're up in the hills, that doesn't apply, but down at the lower end. Um, so yes, it does work even out in Livermore. And then um, Bill is asking about um, recommendations that um, gravel be used around chaparral and desert plants. Do you put this directly on top of the paper um, when you're planting? Let's see, for chaparral, chaparral plants with gravel mulch, do you put some kind of biodegradable mulch on top of the gravel? Uh. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Get rid of the tickle. Um, the gravel mulch is actually a layer of gravel. You, you put the plant in and you put the, the cardboard or, or the newspaper, whatever you choose, and then you put the layer of gravel on top for um, cactus. Um, I really don't like to use it for chaparral, although the research says it can be used for chaparral because the chaparral that we see around here, um, if you go down to like uh, Tres Pinos or um, I think there's a park down there, you'll see beautiful chaparral down there that is very dry and open, doesn't have any rocks at all. It can be used, but um, it's mostly for things that don't like a whole lot of water and need a lot of drainage. Good. And then finally, the only other question I'm seeing right now in the chat is any guidance on native annuals? <laughs> you notice I didn't mention annuals. Um, most native annuals um, 
that I've grown, I've grown to see. And it's pretty much really simple. I just um, put it out, spread the seeds out in an area, put my label out there and, and disturb the soil a little bit so they have a chance to, to go down through the mulch that I have there and then let the natural rains come and, and bring them up. Um, I've gotten um, globe gilia and Chinese houses and all kinds of native flowering annuals that way. Um, you can actually put it out, put the seed out now. Uh, that's why I said, make sure you label it. You should be want to plant something else in the place of it. Um, there are some more temperamental seeds. Uh, if you go to some of the uh, seeds you can get for various bulbs, like the, um, a, good, a good example where I can, um, blue-eyed grass or something like that. That one, you really have to start it more like a, a traditional type of seed. You need to put it in a good mix. I use potting mix for those because they need the moisture more than the other seeds. Um, one of the, the other seeds I'm talking about are ones that are adapted to California and like to have a nice hot, dry summer to actually bake the seeds and then the moisture that they pop open really easy and will set roots. Okay, Bill, Bill saw that there weren't other questions in the chat, so he added a few more. Um, <laughs> when, you keep you, mulch, <laughs> when you keep mulch away from the main stem, the soil at the root ball can be hard as a rock. How can you check the moisture for watering, especially new plants? Okay, you check the moisture outside of the when I that drip line and you don't water next to the uh, root ball you water around the drip line so the, the actual center doesn't get too compacted and yes it will compact because of our clay soil but these plants are adapted hopefully you selected the one that's adapted to clay rather than the ones that are growing in sand if that's what you have <laughs> called right plant in the right place. So if you've got clay, make sure you look for clay plants. Um, and then, um, yeah, the compaction is just a natural process. And the majority of the roots that are absorbing the water, if you think of a, of a tree and you think of the canopy of the tree, uh, if you think of a mirror image underneath the soil, the roots of the tree will spread out almost like a canopy uh, for most plants. Uh, redwoods are an exception, they get taller and, and the roots are wider, but that's an exception. Most of them, um, the depth and width of their root ball are about the same as the canopy above it. In fact, it can be a little bit wider, which is why you water around the plant, you don't water on the plant. Yeah, and Carol, if I could add just from my experience, so if I'm planting a one gallon plant with a, say the stem is, you know, half an inch, quarter to a half inch, I'm not watering around right next to the stem, but I am watering at the edge of where that, where that gallon container would have been so that you're encouraging the roots to move out, but you're also watering the edge of the root ball, the existing root ball, because you don't want the existing root ball, as I understand it, to dry out completely. So it worries me when Bill says the root ball is hard as a rock. Um, it, it, it should be, after you water, it should be moist. Now you don't want to water often, is, is that right or am I off track on that? No, you're absolutely right. You know, you water around it. And that's one of the reasons why you don't really pack the soil really tight around the plant. You just backfill it and you let the water do the work for you so that it will absorb into the, the clay and settle it. In fact, when you're planting it, you, the height of the plant will actually be a little bit taller than the soil around it because it will settle in 
naturally when you water and make sure that, that the water gets to the ends of the roots around the plant. And then Bill is also asking when and how would you coppice a Twin Peaks baccarus? That's a coyote bush, right? Yes. Um, ours have many stems off the base. And then if you did that, how would you water it afterwards? Would you treat it like an established plant or a new plant? First off, can I, can I add to that and ask if a coyote bush can be coppiced? Um, hmm. it, not really true coppice. Uh, I've cut, cut my coyote bush um, when it gets really out of hand after a couple of years. Cut it down to about a foot tall. But I make sure that each one of those stems has a good three or four buds on it. So that when it starts growing the following year, it'll have plenty of growth. And you do not, when you coppice it, you do not touch the roots or the soil or anything else, other than maybe to add some more mulch to keep the ground moist. Um, that's not one of the ones that takes true coppicing. It, you can cut it back severely, uh, it's just a matter of waiting for it to come back. And it's done um, in late winter. Well, January, February time frame. Yeah, I, I think you want to make sure you don't cut off all the growing tips of the plant when you when you're when you're doing that kind of thing. Um, and then what about water? If if he went ahead and did this, what about watering? Would you treat it like a new plant or an old plant? You would treat it like an existing plant. Um, it may seem counterintuitive because it has a lot of growing to do. And it may need a little bit extra water than the, the standard plant, but the roots are already established. And because you're doing it in winter, it'll have all the nutrients and the stored energy that it needs to produce the growth for spring already. You're just gonna be asking it to produce a little bit more growth this year. Oh, Carol, um, Cindy is asking if you could put up that, the previous slide, the resources slide. Um, if you just back up one. I wish I could. I don't know where my screen went to. Oh, well, Cindy, they're all on the handout and I've put that link a couple of times. It's on the, la on the second page of the handout. The last few pages are the list of plants that Carol is, um, was, has been talking about. It's on the third page of the handout. Sorry about that. Okay, and then RB has put up um, several of the, oh, you put up all the resources. Thank you, RB. Okay, he put them right there. Yeah, don't worry about it, Carol. If you wanna stop sharing, that's fine too. Okay, did we have any more questions, anybody? Carol did recommend a couple of books. And if I could also recommend them, one of them is California Native Plant Gardening, a month by month guide by Helen Popper. Very cool book. And the other one with gorgeous pictures, not quite as gorgeous as Carol put up, but California Native Plants for the Garden. Excellent books. And they will get you so excited. They've got such beautiful pictures. Not all California Native Plants look like my Buckeye tree right now, <laughs> which has lost all of its leaves and is summer dormant waiting for the rain. Carol, was there anything else you'd like to add? I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Uh, no, I was expecting more questions, but that's okay. Okay. Um, you went too quick. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you everybody for being here. I wanna thank the Palo Alto Library for co-sponsoring this event, for all of you for attending and for your questions. Um, I think that's it for tonight. So take care and happy gardening. <laughs>